Welcome to this afternoon. My name is Sarah Byford, and I have the pleasure of introducing our lightning talks. Um, I am a firm believer that our early career researchers and research um, students are our most valuable asset, and so anything we can do to support them um, as they make their break to rule the world, which hopefully a lot of you will do, um, is fantastic. So uh, it's a real privilege for me to have the opportunity to introduce these guys for you. Um, it's a little bit like speed dating, uh, but in presentation form. So they have been given five minutes each um, to present an aspect of their current work. And um, we may, if there's time, have a few questions at the end. Um, so without further ado, our first speaker today is Caroline. And Caroline is going to talk to us today about pathways into and out of homelessness in a cohort of individuals with severe mental illness in rural Ethiopia, a qualitative study. Caroline, where are you? Thank you for being here today. My name is Caroline Smart. I'm going to talk to you today about pathways into and out of homelessness among people with severe mental illness in rural Ethiopia. We know that there's a relationship between homelessness and mental illness, but there's little evidence coming from low and middle income countries. We're now gonna present our work from Ethiopia. Our goal is to develop an understanding of how people become homeless and their pathways out of homelessness in order to inform future interventions. At the time of our study, mental health care delivered at the primary care level have recently been introduced into the district as part of the PRIME project. This qualitative study was nested within the prime Ethiopia psychosis cohort. And we defined homelessness as any experience of sleeping outside the home, unsheltered, overnight. Myself and a trained Ethiopian colleague conducted in-depth interviews in the local language of Amharic. We interviewed 15 people with lived experience of severe mental illness and homelessness, 12 men and three women, and 11 caregivers, six men and five women. To be sensitive to the socio-cultural context, Ethiopian colleagues were closely involved in every phase of study design, implementation, and analysis. And we used thematic analysis. So, what do we find? Homelessness itself is a complicated phenomenon in our setting as elsewhere. We found that there are two main typologies of homelessness in our sample. Long-term homelessness and intermittent or episodic homelessness. In those with long-term homelessness, homeless people were much more dislocated from their families and communities of origin and were living full-time on the streets. In intermittent homelessness, people cycled in and out of homelessness and had a much greater degree of family contact. In both types of homelessness, we found a constellation of factors involved in both leading to and leaving homelessness. These factors interacted with one another. The most frequently mentioned pathways into homelessness were family conflict and mental ill health. This was exacerbated by substance use, particularly in those with intermittent homelessness. Some people reported that they left home to escape from coercion, including physical restraint. <clears throat> for others, this was escape from a perceived deprivation of liberty, for example, because of being closely monitored by their families. While family conflict was a common precipitant for homelessness, family and community intervention and support was crucial for people to return home. Families took a flexible and wide-ranging array of measures to help their hom homeless family members to return home, including active searching to return them home in the evenings, radio advertisements to locate missing persons, and reliance on informal neighborhood networks in identifying and returning lost family members. Families adapted these strategies in response to the movements of the person who was homeless, and these strategies also depended on families' ability to draw on financial and other resources at any given time. Medical treatment was a stepping stone to leaving homelessness when it could be coupled with family and community support. Some people with intermittent homelessness returned to their homes on their own accord, showing their autonomy and their decisions about where they were staying. Community mobilization and support activities ranged from providing shelter to the facilitation of medical care, assisting with family searching, and helping with daily basic needs. In several extraordinary cases, community members hosted non-related strangers for short and intermediate durations. Helping with daily basic needs like providing food and water was the most common way for community members to help non-related <coughs> homeless people. 
This slide presents a few quotes from study participants. The first quote is a caregiver's account of how his family member became homeless due to mental ill health and substance use. The second quote describes an extraordinary situation where in a Muslim family in a different community enabled a homeless man unknown to them to access Orthodox Christian holy water treatment and live with them for a number of months. They then gave him the money to return home when he was ready. The third quote is from a previously homeless man in recovery who says that the community should help homeless people while they wait to access medical care. In conclusion, different types of service responses are needed to address the different types of homelessness as well as the individual complexities of this problem. Ending long-term homelessness will likely require transitional housing in addition to medical and social support, with family re reunification as a second step. Approaches to intermittent homelessness might be better focused on building up the family unit and learning how to manage problematic substance use. For all homeless people with SMI, antipsychotic medication needs to be embedded within a broader psychosocial basis of care. Services should be person-centered and need to take into account the needs and preferences of the individual with SMI. A human rights-based approach is essential. Future work must focus on identifying and then supporting and bolstering the strategies already used by those with SMI, their families, and communities. And global mental health as a field needs to prioritize people with SMI with complex needs, including homelessness, and find appropriate service responses. This is going to go beyond task shifting approaches alone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. So next up, we have Elaine, who's going to talk about the mental health impacts of El Nino-related effects. Sorry, this is hard to say, on affected residents in the northern coast of Peru. Thank you very much, Elaine. Thank you. Um, my, well, my name is Elaine Flores. I am finally in, uh, finalizing my last year of PhD in uh, LSSTM and I am really grateful for this opportunity. I am really interested in this topic. I am also Peruvian, and so I will be really brief in this. Um, so I will be presenting um, an environmental phenomenon that is actually a global one, and it's uh, labeled El Niño, uh, South Oscillation, and it leads to periodic extreme weather irregularities causing floods, landslides, and intense precipitations in the coastal areas of the equatorial Pacific Ocean. There is also evidence that climate change uh, will increase both uh, the frequency and impact of this cyclical uh, event. Thank you. Uh, across uh, low and middle income countries, there will also be a mark uh, an equal risk among groups uh, some, some of them will be uh, more prone to experience uh, the full uh, disaster consequences as the residents of high-risk areas, uh, those living in informal settlements, and where there is less enforcement uh, of preventive public policies, as uh, happens in Peru, as in similar other more low- and middle-income countries. So in this context, uh, we decided to study uh, the effects of El Niño phenomenon in the affected communities in the north coast of Peru. So in 2015 and 2016 uh, occurred an El Niño event, which was classified as strong uh, by its precipitation level in the northern Peru. Unexpectedly, after that, uh, between uh, February and April 2017, a local, uh, a local event labeled Coastal El Niño affected most of the Peruvian coast with actually unprecedented magnitude leading to overflowing rivers, flash floods, and mudslides. Um, you can uh, take that into account because usually you will be expecting uh, a strong event of El Niño between five and 10 years. However, this uh, occurred actually with not much uh, notice in advance. Official reports of damages estimated over 1.83 million people affected. Uh, the damages included uh, 40,000 homes, uh, health facilities, schools, roads, bridges, and in addition, the floods also destroyed drinking water infrastructure and over 40, uh, 400,000 farming acres. 
so what we did uh, was a secondary data analysis uh, linking individual and ecological level data related to El Nino period. Uh, so we use participant level data from a three-year pragmatic step wedge cluster randomized trial conducted by a Crónicas group from Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia. Uh, each participant uh, included was evaluated at baseline and every five months in six follow-up visits. Uh, mild depression cases uh, were defined for this study as uh, having a PHQ-9 score of equal or more than five. Uh, so, also we developed a conceptual framework uh, based on a priori uh, set of confounders. So, as you can see, we were considering main exposures uh, defined through the extreme precipitations and flooding events. Uh, those would be directly impacting the communities and individuals uh, through uh, damages uh, measured through houses, damages affected persons, and crop losses. Um, also, though, that will be increasing the psychosocial distress and depression symptoms. Some baseline socio-demographic factors were also considered to be potentially associated. And having a previous uh, a baseline mental illness, chronic comorbidities, uh, health-related uh, disability, and lacking access to health services were also considered as potential confounders. Um, so, we, uh, in, we included in the study data from 2,376 adults. Um, they were included from six villages in Tumbes, Peru. The baseline depression prevalence, um, we found that it uh, steadily decreased across the study visits, irrespective of the occurrence of El Niño. Um, in the crude models, uh, we found that the odds of uh, air temperature, mean superficial sea temperature, and crop losses were associated uh, with developing depression in the follow-up period. However, in the adjusted, uh, in the fully adjusted model, uh, we, the, which explored El Niño effects by baseline income, it was not possible to estimate associations with the occurrence of El Niño and its effects. Uh, therefore, our findings in the quantitative component uh, do not support the hypothesis that El Niño affected depression rates on the study participants. However, we also need uh, to take into account um, that uh, we have contrasted this uh, quantitative component with a qualitative one uh, that we conducted in the same villages. Um, this is not presented here. However, uh, one of the conclusions from uh, taking into account both components uh, suggests that it, uh, first, that it may not be always possible to obtain a direct measurable effect of a common mental health outcome related uh, to a phenomenon's impact, in addition to past exposure to similar cyclical effects. And also the inclusion of uh, mild depression cases, um, the, um, the possibility of a spontaneous remission of depression. Also, uh, there has been a lot of um, media uh, enforcement in the communities uh, that El Niño effects were actually uh, milder than they were expected. And finally, uh, possible and measured local resilience promoting factors, as well as uh, the trial participants also received a um, marketing uh, campaign uh, to facilitate the, the addition of uh, the study intervention we think that those factors may have also influenced this, these findings. Thank you for the, your attention. Thank you very much, Elaine. So next up we have Georgia, who's going to talk to us um, about from the lab to the field, measuring brain activity and eye movements to assess neurodevelopment in low resource settings. Thank you very much, Georgia. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Georgia Lockwood-Estrin. I'm a research fellow at Birkbeck College um, and I've just returned from a year's working um, in New Delhi with Sangaf in order to conduct some data collection that I'll be talking to you about today. So I am going to be talking about bringing technologies from a lab environment into the field within a community settings um, in a, a low resource environment in order to measure brain development um, and child development. <clears throat> so a little bit of background first of all. Um, this figure here um, shows uh, shows that the 
the majority of children, about 95% of children who have developmental disorders and specifically autism spectrum disorders, live in low income um, settings. And a recent population based prevalence study highlighted that there's an estimated between four and five million children currently living um, with autism in India um, at the moment. However, um, the majority of these children are are not diagnosed and therefore they're unable to get the treatment, care and support that they and their family need. This can be due to a whole host of reasons, but a key one is that there's a real lack of validated tools that can be used within different environments that have been validated, especially in community settings. And that is what um, I'm talking to you about today. Um, however, in high income and especially in lab-based environments, we have so many, many tools at our disposal in order to assess neurodevelopment. And what we want to understand is whether we can use these technologies and these new tools in order to assess neurodevelopment um, in low resource settings. <clears throat> Um, and so that, uh, that is exactly what we're doing. We're using two different technologies, EEG, which directly measures um, child or uh, brain activity in children, and eye tracking, which is a more of an indirect measure of child development. And we're looking at these two different technologies, bringing them from a highly, um, highly controlled lab-based setting into a highly uncontrolled um, field community setting in and around Delhi. We're looking at these two technologies specifically for two reasons. The first is that there's a high evidence base from lab environments that markers that have been established using these technologies can predict or associate with cognitive development in children. The second is that specific markers, for example, social attention, that have been derived from these different technologies have been associated with autism symptoms in children. But it's not only the evidence that we're um, focusing on these technologies for, it's also their potential for scalability. Um, they are both non-invasive and they provide objective markers for child development, um, which allows um, offers the potential to be used by um, lay health workers or um, w um, health workers that are not highly specialised. So, um, in, over the last year, we've been doing these data, data collection um, in, um, in community centres um, in Delhi. Um, I've been, uh, there's been two different sort of tr um, study designs. The first is a test-retest reliability study to understand whether these technologies can be used in a reliable way um, in these uncontrolled settings. Um, and the second is a case control pilot dis, um, study where we're looking at whether these markers can be used to um, identify children who are at high risk of autism spectrum disorders. And we're also looking at whether they're feasible and acceptable for use in these two different settings. <clears throat> So, um, as you can imagine, during data collection, there are a number of different challenges, some of which are not um, uh, related to the, the, uh, uh, just the environment we're in. For example, child behavior often disrupted the assessments we were doing, but we find that just as much in the lab as we did in the community. Um, but um, some, uh, some were sort of unique to the environment we were in, so the technologies that we're using do require power input, and some of the community centers that we were based in either had fluctuating power or no power supply at all, and and therefore, we had to carry um, a battery with us where we went. Um, and also, we, uh, as I was saying, we're going from a, a lab-based environment where you, where you can really strictly control all aspects, noise, light, temperature, into the community where you can't control any of these aspects. Um, and therefore, we had um, many external disruptions. We were often on very busy high roads. We were trying to um, be in community centers that were as close to the families participating as possible. Um, and therefore, um, that is, was dictated where we went rather than um, uh, um, other, other factors. Um, however, despite this, we did, um, looking at the acceptability, we had a high um, degree of acceptability measured both by um, qu questionnaires to parents immediately follow following the assessment, but we also did in-depth interviews with a, um, a subgroup of, the, of parents of these children. Um, and some of the key things that came out of it were some of the facilitators um, to participation um, in this research um, was the importance of engaging um, the entire family and um, wider community in these assessments, including grandparents, as well as immediate family members. And some of the barriers to participation mainly focused on logistical barriers of the importance of these assessments being as close to the family home as possible. 
So, um, as I've said, we've just sort of just finished or recently finished data collection. We've been looking at acceptability, and the next steps are to understand and look more deeply at um, the feasibility and um, how data quality is affected um, by uh, bringing these technologies from the lab to the field, um, and then to look at the validity of using the assessments in order to identify children at high risk of autism and developmental delays. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Um, so next up we have Matthew, who's going to talk to us about the potential of Buddhist Ayurvedic counselling and psychiatry for global mental health. Thank you very much, Matthew. So uh, what originally inspired me into this, this whole area was a uh, sort of uh, personal experience of uh, mental health problems, uh, psychosis. The first time was in, uh, in the UK when I was 18. And on that occasion, I was handcuffed, um, uh, dragged into an ambulance, strapped down onto a stretcher. And then when I arrived in hospital, I was restrained and injected by force. So that was the first time. And the second uh, experience was uh, about two years later in, uh, in, in Sri Lanka. So at that time, I was with a non-government organization doing some voluntary work. And um, so the experiences were quite similar, but, but the, the circumstances were different. So I, uh, I ended up being sort of looked after by, by a farmer in a village. And uh, uh, it, it was known locally as uh, Master Uncle, but he uh, he kind of uh, introduced me to Ayurveda, and um, also I, I learned a bit more about Buddhism while I was there in Sri Lanka. So, so I'll just say a bit later on, I became a mental health nurse, and um, become a Buddhist and an Ayurvedic uh, therapist. So that's what I'm doing these days in South London. And um, in Sri Lanka, there's this tradition called the Nila Mahara psychiatry tradition. So it's basically, um, a Nila Mahara is a village in Sri Lanka uh, where for about 350 years, uh, there's been uh, local sort of specialists in mental health. So they've got their own local tradition specializing in mental health problems. So you can see on the top, on the top uh, left is um, one of the earlier doctors he was uh, living in around like 1854 he was born. And in the bottom right is, um, is Dr. Saman Hetich, who's the, uh, who's the managing director of the Manasa Ayurveda Hospital. So what I've got to show you here is, uh, it was supposed to be on the slides, but they kind of didn't, didn't quite work. So I'm just gonna go to a video. And um, I'll try and talk as I do that. <laughs> So in the uh, Nila Mahara tradition, as in Ayurveda generally, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, if you help with that, I'll take a look and choose. So, um, yeah, so herbal oils are used, and sort of herbs and oils are used for um, application to the scalp. This is one of the local physical treatments. And um, in this video, which hopefully will work, it did work earlier, so I'm not sure what's going on. So in this video, you can see some oil production, local oil production, and, and it's, what they do is, oh, there it is, cool. So, yeah. <laughs> So what's going on there is that, is that it basically takes about three days to, to make this stuff. Oh, we'll stop it. Yeah. So the chanting is, the, is something called the Metta Sutta, which is a teaching on loving kindness. And um, so they're holding a thread, and that thread's like connected to a pole in the oil. And so this kind of um, intention of loving kindness goes into the oil, and the whole process of the treatment, including the making of the oils, is sort of uh, trying to um, cultivate loving kindness. And so um, 
yeah, and the oil's made out of herbs that are boiled in water for, for like a long time until you get about a quarter of the water that you had. You get rid of the herbs, you put the decoction with oil, and then that's cooked together, and that's what he's doing there. So um, that's in Nila Mahara village, and that, that was just taken about a year ago, that video, um, by, the, by uh, Dr. Salmon. So I'm going to show you... Uh, so this is a place now, if this works, oh God, another video. I don't know, can you, I'm not, I'm not a PC person. Cheers. So the doctors these days from Nila Mahara, so Dr. Salmon and another doctor, Dr. Ruan, there's no sound on it, so. They, they train at this place, is Nargananda International Institute for Buddhist Studies. So these are like various sorts of Ayurvedic practitioners from around Sri Lanka, and, and Professor Sumanapala is the, is the professor there who's founded this, this practice of, of, um, of uh, Buddhist Ayurvedic counseling and psychiatry. It combines uh, the physical aspects, the oils and those kind of treatments, along with uh, what we can call it, uh, behavioral therapy, mental therapy, and cognitive therapy, which is kind of like his translations of some of the sort of Buddhist psychology that's applied. And this is our graduation. There was myself and, um, and the, the monk there is Dr. Uh, da Jing. He's a practitioner in Chinese medicine. He's from China originally and became a Theravadan monk. And he's, he's lived in Sri Lanka for probably about 10 years now. So the last slide is about how... Um, Ugh, open it all again. <laughs> but basically, the last slide just tells you about what, what the next step, step has been. So it's about introducing this whole approach in the UK, in London. And I'll go to the last year. That's it. So... In terms of the potential for global mental health, is thinking about how this whole practice, the Buddhist Ayurvedic counselling and psychiatry, may be introduced elsewhere in, in the world. So I use this constructivist grounded theory on selected Buddhist and Ayurvedic texts, English translations, and, um, and then um, also contemporary lectures were recorded, and, and I did a kind of... Uh, grounded theory analysis of that stuff, and then the uh, literature review on randomised control trials of uh, RCTs on some of the treatment methods. So some of the herbs have had randomised control trials on those, and and some of them have been you know been shown to be effective. So there is that kind of evidence is there, not a great deal because it was done in India most of it where the trials were small, but there is there are research done, and so on that basis there was the. Uh, one-to-one -one intervention developed, and also a group protocol, which was an eight-week course. And so 55 anonymous feedback uh, forms were received from Londoners of different backgrounds. And so it was shown that Buddhist Ayurvedic counselling and psychiatry has a strong um, uh, textually grounded theory. Basically, it's the, the practice is linked up tightly with the theory and um, mental health service users and also general public because it was advertised to the general public and they came to a temple in West London for, the, for these sessions. And uh, they find it really, they wanted more sessions at the end of the eight weeks. So they enjoyed it, they liked it, they engaged with it. Um, it offers a new approach for mental health and wellbeing in the UK and potentially elsewhere around the world. And uh, further evaluation is, is, and, and research I think is worth doing on this. So it's, yeah, there we are, cheers. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, so next up we have Nicole, um, who is going to talk to us about the development and validation of the Avita 1.1 framework, which I'll let her explain because it's a long title. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Nicole Vitruva. Um, my supervisors um, are Graham Thornycroft and Jonathan Grant at King's College London, and I'm doing a PhD in global mental health. We're talking today about the road to global mental health and the challenges that mental health faces, um, particularly in low resource settings. Getting research and into pro policy and practice is one of the key problems we're facing along the way, and efforts often fail for mental health. 
how can research be more effectively translated into policy in order to eventually improve mental health practice? This is the question of my PhD. <coughs> Excuse me. The process of translating research into policy and practice is complex. But we, we can facilitate this process if we focus on improving relationships between researchers and policymakers, and if we target the policy agenda setting stage. What do I mean by policy agenda setting stage? And why should we target it? If we look at a very simple model, we can see that research is being often taken into practice. This is what we understand as, research, as implementation science. When we try to get policies, or when we look at how to get policies into practice, this is called what we call policy implementation. What I'm looking at is how to get research better into policy. And this is what is called agenda setting. I've developed a framework specifically designed for mental health research in low and middle income countries called Evita. The aim of Evita is to improve the translation of mental health research into policy. And it uses a focus on the policy agenda setting stage as a novel mechanism. How did we develop Invita? Invita was developed in a number of steps. First, we did a systematic review of theories and frameworks on mental health research and um, policy agenda setting in low and middle income countries. From this, we derived the core themes in the frameworks we found drafted a provisional framework called Evita 1.0 and then validated it for its applicability to mental health. So does, does it really fulfill all the criteria that we as ascribe to mental health? And it was a specifically developed validation framework. We validated it then through in-depth interviews with experts. And we had a specifically developed evaluation framework for our framework. We revised Evita, added theoretical agenda setting and advocacy elements to make sure that we're targeting the policy um, stage and the policy agenda setting stage and the uptake of mental health research is maximized. And then we finalized the Evita 101 framework. So how does Evita work? So we imagine they're evidence generators. This is the core research, core scientific research that we see. These are research out, out, um, outreach centers and implementation science. We have the political context and we have the enactors. These are the people and organizations that put the research and policies into practice. These are linked by intermediaries. So these intermediaries are key people and organizations who help to take and uptake the research and link it to policymakers. <clears throat> and this is all embedded into external influences, and these vary from country to country and from setting to setting. The efforts of translating um, research, mental health research, into policy can be improved through capacity building, through communication, relationship, and partnership building, and through framing. This means providing a clear evidence problem and a clear evidence solution. And then, as we've heard from others already, like um, Ricardo, um, we have catalysts that occur. And also advocacy coalitions, I forgot to mention. These are um, also very supportive and can enhance the uptake and the push to formulate one single policy ask. We have these catalysts occurring. The catalysts are incidents or where mental health is suddenly um, achieving global attention or attention, national attention on the policy or in the media agenda. Um, or awareness with policy, let's say, in the public eye. Um, and then political will, so the motives and opportunities within the political context for policymakers increase. And a window of opportunity opens up, and mental health is taken on the policy agenda setting stage. So who's Evita for? Evita um, aims to improve mental health research evidence and policymaking processes and to increase engagement and the capacity of mental health researchers, health policy makers, think tanks, NGOs, and others working on mental health policy interrelationships. What's next? 
Currently, Evita is being validated in a multi-level multi case study in South Africa. After this, it should help guide action for mental health researchers and others to increase the uptake of research on the policy agenda, and hopefully to function as a signpost for more evidence-based practice on the road to global mental health. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, so next up, we have Honor, who's going to talk to us about evaluating the roles, sorry, the role of levels of exposure to a task-shared depression counseling intervention. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you'll be able to see me behind the, the podium. Um, I'm from the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, Durban. And the work that I am presenting is from the Program for Improving Mental Health Care Consortium. Um, and I'm uh, presenting a sub-study for a cohort study that we had undertaken. Um, before I go on, um, I'd just like to say it's a real privilege and an honor to be able to stand here as an early researcher and present before the people who have paved the way for us and are continuing to mentor us and provide opportunities for us to be able to do this sort of work. And not only in academia, but for some people um, like me who are also interested in how um, the ministries of health can intersect um, with the academic work and seeing how academia can actually go into the Ministry of Health and work with them on the ground because I think that interface could be one way of getting um, evidence um, being implemented in, in policies. Okay, I can't seem to get to the next slide. Space. All right, so the objectives of this particular study were to evaluate the relationship uh, between levels of exposure to um, a counselor-led psychosocial intervention um, with uh, the psychosocial outcomes looking at depression, functional disability, and internalized stigma. Um, comparing baseline and 12 months follow-up, as well as to understand how the intervention produces change and how service users interacted with the intervention activities. Um, the first finding is with the patient health uh, questionnaire. Um, we see an overall significant reduction in depression at uh, 12 months, and specifically um, service users receiving five to eight sessions had the greatest reduction in page Q9 scores uh, from baseline to end line. We then look at functional disability, which was measured using the HUDAS, and we see, once again, functional disability improving from baseline to end line, and a significant um, improvement in functional disability in participants who received five to eight sessions when compared to those who had not received any sessions. Going on to internalized um, stigma, using the ISMI, we see an overall improvement from baseline to end line and um, a great improvement in participants who received se uh, se uh, five to eight uh, sessions especially when compared to those who had received one to four. So with the qualitative interviews, service use, the service was reported as, as acceptable and accessible by the service users. Um, session attendance was hindered by women's caregiving burden, poor counselor attributes and poor referral processes. Attendance was promoted by availability of services, meaning where the Counselor was available in a facility. Awareness and helpfulness of counseling sessions and counselor qualities. Um, this means that the service users themselves were aware that they were improving as they continued with the sessions. Um, yeah, and if the counselor was particularly um, patient-centered, it, it helped with the attendance. 
Participants who received five to eight sessions reported improved functionality, reduced self-stigma, and reported to have been empowered to self-manage, be more self-reliant, and were capacitated with skills to improve their quality of life. Um, this was a very, very short um, presentation because of the time that we were given. But with regards to conclusion recommendations, the five to eight sessions were found to be optimal in the reduction of depression symptoms, reduction of functional disability, and reduction of internalized stigma. Factors that promoted um, attendance include counselors with person-centered qu uh, care qualities, referral processes that included being provided with an explanation as to how counseling could benefit the service user, by, which was made by the referring nurse, and being connected to the counselor, either by being walked to the counseling room or introduced to the counselor. This particular study is important, especially in areas um, in uh, low and middle income countries with scarce um, service providers, mental health uh, providers, um, because it enables us to optimize on the services that are available. You know, not just provide task sharing, but to be able to provide optimal services. And that brings me to the end of my um, presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. So next we are moving on to Roxanne, who's going to talk to us about psychosocial interventions for common mental disorders in women experiencing intimate partner violence in low and middle income countries. Hi, everyone. My name is Roxanne Kanajad. I'm a trainee psychiatrist in the UK NHS, and I've just started the third year of my PhD supervised by Dr. Charlotte Hannon, who you heard from earlier, and Professor Louise Howard at King's College London. So you, I've been very helped by the presentations that have gone before me. Um, you've seen a few slides about just how many high quality randomized controlled trials of brief talking therapies there have been in low and middle income countries. You might remember the um, Singler et al. meta-analysis that showed that the effect size overall in diverse settings with diverse interventions was quite high, 0.49. Um, but the hypothesis of this piece of work, which is the first paper out of my PhD, is that perhaps tailoring these interventions to the specific needs of the populations that we deliver them to makes them more effective. You heard earlier from Professor Danese about the role of childhood trauma. Um, and what I'm quite interested in, and I think is a neglected area of research, is the fact that in the same households in which children experience traumatic events, the adults are also going through a lot of trauma themselves. And in this case, the focus is intimate partner violence. You might sense just in the kind of zeitgeist that Me Too and a general recognition of gender inequality is in the air lately in the last few years. And actually, these RCTs are slowly beginning more regularly and routinely to measure whether the participants in the RCTs are experiencing traumatic factors such as gender-based violence. So that's the focus of the results I'm going to present here today. Um, as you've heard, we were told to only do three slides, so I've cheated like everyone else and tried to put lots of animations to get around this. But I won't talk you through this um, really detailed flow diagram. I've kind of put the highlights in big letters. So. Um, when you do a meta-analysis, you start with a systematic review, and when I did a very careful search to try not to miss any studies, I started out with over 8,000 results. When I got rid of the duplicates, there were more than 5,000. Um, but then when it got down to just randomized controlled trials of psychosocial interventions in low-middle-income countries, or quite a few, 491 based on just title and abstract screening. But when I look closely, um, very few had measured exposure to intimate partner violence for various reasons, but largely because it probably wasn't an a priori consideration of the studies. Um, but 21 studies did measure IPV exposure. Um, what I should have said a bit earlier on is that intimate partner violence is physical, sexual, psychological, and coercive control forms of abuse and violence against a person who may be male or female, but is very often female, um, by her partner or ex-partner. Um, it's known to be a um, highly prevalent social determinant of physical and mental health. So in these cases, there were 21 RCTs in low-middle-income countries that did measure um, 
exposure to IPV. And of those, um, very generously, the authors um, of most of them, 70%, shared their data with me so that I could present the results I'll show you now. So the kind of headline finding of the meta-analysis, um, and this is where I say I'm cheating with the slides, um, is that um, what you're looking at there is not a traditional meta-analysis where on the left it means it worked or it didn't work, but rather on the left it suggests that it's, the intervention is more effective in people who are not reporting intimate partner violence, and if the diamond is shifted to the right, then it's more effective in the people who do report IPV. My hypothesis was that generic talking therapies would be less effective in people reporting IPV, but in fact I found the opposite trend. Um, the results weren't all statistically significant, but the trend was similar across four different common mental disorders that were measured. So for depression, um, there was a general non-significant indication that women experiencing IPV did benefit more than women who didn't from generic talking therapies in low-middle income countries. For PTSD, the same direction of effect. Um, I've put some bubbles there just to show which are the ones that have the most extreme um, effect. PST is problem-solving therapy. That one is um, Dixon Chibanda's Friendship Bench. Um, behavioral activation is a, a Bolton et al. study done in Iraq. Um, the uh, supportive counselling is also from the BAS group in Iraq, um, and they found that that was more effective for PTSD in women experiencing IPV. Um, the one finding that was significant was anxiety symptoms, which only had five papers in the meta-analysis, but there was a 30% greater effect size in the women experiencing IPV than the women not experiencing IPV um, who received those interventions. And then a kind of generic measure of psychological distress showed the same trend, but it was non-significant. Um, so then I was just interested if there are any subgroup effects that I could detect. So I had a look at whether um, if the intervention itself had an explicit trauma focus in its design, whether it was more or less effective in this way. And this um, sub-comparison shows that for anxiety, it looked as though the ones that were trauma-focused um, were more effective for the women experiencing IPV, which is probably what you would expect. But the, the caveat would be that it's a very small number of studies, and categorizing what is officially trauma-focused and what um, may address trauma symptoms incidentally is a little bit difficult to do and probably um, should be taken with a, with a pinch of salt as a finding. Um, in the opposite direction though which I thought was interesting was that for depression it seemed like the um, generic interventions for depression rather than the ones that delved a lot into trauma seemed to be more effective um, for women experiencing IPV um, and is there a dose response effect because in fact that's the the result we just heard about from One that the more sessions you had the more effective they were um, it, do it does look like that for um, PTSD, where you can see um, the furthest to the right diamond is 12 to 14 sessions, and the most central diamond is up to six. So it does suggest for improving PTSD, more sessions seems to be more effective, which is what you'd expect. Um, and a similar thing is going on with anxiety, but there are a lot of confounders because the same studies that had more sessions were also conducted um, in uh, places with other shared factors. So again, need to take those findings with a pinch of salt. Um, again, rural versus urban, it seemed like in the urban areas, women experiencing IPV benefited more than women who didn't. Um, and those were just the highlight findings of that meta-analysis. So I guess the take-home points that I would suggest are um, we know that intimate partner violence is a social determinant of physical and mental health. It doesn't seem on its own to detrimentally affect women's ability to benefit from treatment for psychological interventions, which is really good news. But going forward, it would be really nice to know whether if we do tailor those interventions to the specific traumatic experiences of that community, whether they can be made even more effective, acceptable, feasible, and um, scalable in that context. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. Next up, we have Wubalem, who is going to talk to us about multidimensional impact of severe mental illness on family members in rural Ethiopia. Thank you very much. Okay. 
thank you very much. My name is Wubalem uh, Fikadu. I am a PhD student at Addis Ababa University under the Amari Consortium, and I'm supervised by Dr. Awa Fikadu and Professor Tom Craig. So let me start by telling you the story of this 10 years old young boy. This little boy is plowing while his friends are at school. He had to do this because his father was diagnosed with schizophrenia a long time ago. Due to this, this little boy had to be the man of the house and support the family. In my PhD, I'm trying to see the impact of severe mental illness on family members and the community at large. And we managed to interview 26 fam 27 family members, five individuals with the illness, and six community members. And the result we get shows that severe mental illness had multidimensional long-term impacts on the family and the community at large. So there is a difference in extent, distribution, and level of the impact. And these impacts include psychological problems, social and economical problems, and special impacts on children and spouse. The stress reported were associated with behavior of the patient and the stigma associated with the illness. And the reported social impacts include problem in forming social relationships, including marriage, and there was a report of lesser social involvement compared to their neighbors and their participation before the onset of the illness. And the economical problems were related with disability, behavior of the patient. For example, there was two reports of setting fire to their house, cost of treatment, mainly for traditional treatment, and discrimination from different safety net programs. So, the spouse and children share the overall burden. They do have special impacts. And uh, for example, spouse were left mainly alone to care for their children. And there was a report of sexual impact. And children's like that little boy should shoulder the responsibility of the house, like doing the farm and participating in income generation generate activities. And these children may not go to school or they may drop out early. This is a quote from a wife of a man with schizophrenia. I may not marry him if I knew he had the illness. His friends were, they, they care for their children, but our children go to school in their before. Thinking of my children, I am still living with him. Moving to the coping mechanisms, the commonly mentioned coping mechanisms were suicide. There were two reports of suicide, substance abuse, hard work to cover the part of the patient, migration, and divorce. In conclusion, this is a summary based on the social and ecological model. Which, try, which shows the interaction between patient-related factors, the family, and the community. And in conclusion, any intervention sh should address the dimensions I have tried to show. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our last lightning talk today is from Prakash, who is going to talk to us about community perceptions on the feasibility and acceptability 
of the implementation of a group-based psychological intervention for adolescents um, with depression in rural Nepal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shyamal. Hello. Um, I'm Prakash Bhagi. I'm from Nepal. I work uh, in TPO Nepal as a project coordinator. My today's presentation explores community perception on the design and implementation of group-based IPT intervention. This paper is a uh, part of larger research project that is called Sathi. Sathi means uh, it is a Nepali term and the English translation is friend. Sathi aims to adopt the WHO interpersonal therapy manual. This manual is developed for adults, but now we are testing for adolescents in low middle income countries. And uh, to be especially, we want to test it uh, with the adolescents in Nepal, especially in the rural Nepal, that is called Sindhupalchok. It is quite a little bit far from Kathmandu. It shares border with the China. Briefly, IPT intervention is a group-based psychology therapy. It focuses on the problem, four problem areas. Sorry. <clears throat> the problem areas are a grief, interpersonal dispute, role transition, and the interpersonal deficit. Sati has a multiple adaptation process. It basically includes quantitative and qualitative research, uh, literature review, and the review of the IPT manual by the Nepalese and the international expert. The qualitative research includes uh, 34 interviews, semi-structured interviews, and 10 FZDs with the depressed and non-depressed adolescents, their parents, teachers, and the community health workers. <clears throat> so here are some findings of the Sathi research, uh, but now I'm more especially focusing on the findings of the qualitative study that we did during the adaptation. <clears throat> So the, our stakeholders supported the idea of group-based intervention. They like the IPT intervention, but they are quite worried about the potential barrier. So the key barrier is Sindhupalsak is in hilly area, so the remoteness is the potential barrier. So students, I mean the participant for the group IPT intervention, has to travel many hours to attend the group session. So one key barrier is the ge geographical remoteness. So the another uh, key barrier is the household works. So in Nepalese culture, and I mean the parents expect their son, daughter uh, to work before the school and after the schools. So you know, if they engage in the household works, they will not give time for the IPT session. So this is also the uh, another barrier. And the parents also do not want to, uh, you know, um, do not want to talk their family problem into the group session. So they don't want to send their children into the session. So mental health stigma is another key barrier. This is why they are recommending school-based intervention. You know, doing activities in a school is less stigmatized than doing activities in the community. That's why they are recommending school-based intervention. And uh, stakeholders have some reservation about the IPT intervention. They want facilitator with the same gender, but the facilitator need to be, need to be from the community, uh, from the local community. Um, is between 20 to 24 years old. Teachers, social workers, health workers were highly recommended. Um, the venue, IPT venue, um, need to be in safe and non-judgmental place for sharing their problem. Uh, school is highly recommended. Mixing different caste and ethnic groups in a uh, in a group is uh, recommended, but they requested to differentiate 
uh, they group according to age and gender. Parents' teacher involvement in the group is strongly rejected by adolescents, but the parents want to be involved in the group session because they want to change the functional, functional impairment changes brought by our uh, intervention. So another is abstinism is our key challenges. So to avoid the abstinism, the stakeholder um, suggested us to do some kind of entertaining activities, uh, reminding calls, phone calls, sensitizing parents about the potential benefit of the epitization. These were the suggested by the uh, uh, stakeholders. These are the, some of the findings from our study, which directly informs uh, our inter intervention. Currently, we are piloting this interven intervention, and these uh, re results will be published in early next year. Thank you so much. Um, I've been instructed we don't have time for questions, so you can all relax, breathe a sigh of relief. Um, however, uh, <laughs> I do want to thank you all for some amazing talks. Thank you all very much.